There are two readings this morning. The first is the story of Jesus has, Jesus has risen, Luke 24, verses 13 to 49. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with, with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What are you discussing with each other as you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name is Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who was prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group, <coughs> some women of our group, astounded us. They were the, at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed and indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it was just a woman, just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interrupted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which, <coughs> excuse me, as they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if they were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it almost every evening because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went, went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, We are not hearts burning within us. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told, <clears throat> then, then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known, to them, made known to them in the breaking of the... The second reading is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian and is from Acts 8, 26-40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian, Enoch, a court official of the Candace, a queen of Ethiopians, in charge of the entire treasurer. He had come to, his, to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home seated in his chariot he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, now how, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before the shearer, so, does, so he does not open his mouth. To his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation? For his life was taken away from earth. The Enoch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. 
<clears throat> As they were going along the road, they came to, to some water. And the Enoch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the Enoch, went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the Enoch was, saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Thus endeth the reading of the lesson. Thanks, Ron. So way back on the Saturday uh, before the first Sunday of Lent, March 8th, I think it was, Karen and I stepped off the bullet train from Paris at, in Bayonne and on to a much older, slower train that took us to the little village of Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port. There weren't very many of us on the train, and I think we all had the backpacks and shells and stuff that marked us as peregrinos, pilgrims on the way of St. James. So imagine the train chugging up the hills towards the Pyrenees, carrying this motley collection of strangers. Some looked a lot like hippies. A few looked a little like bankers. And we were all about to be thrown together on the same adventure.
So before we uh, rejoin the pilgrims in Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port, let's uh, have a quick look at the scriptures. There are a couple of important stories, I think. The first is an Easter story. Um, it's the Emmaus Road story in Luke. Two disciples, a couple perhaps, are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. My assumption is that they're probably going home. Maybe even giving up now that Jesus is gone. They seem lost and confused. They're walking and talking, and as happens sometimes on the trail, a stranger falls into step with them, and a conversation naturally ensues. They're just talking about what's been happening in Jerusalem. And the stranger has an interesting perspective on the matter. They are intrigued as they listen to him. And when they arrive at their destination, seeing the hour was late, they invite the stranger to stay with them to continue the conversation. There's a song we sing about this story. Stay with us through the night. Stay with us through the pain. Stay with us, blessed stranger, till the morning breaks again. You remember the story. The stranger turns out to be the risen Christ. And when he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them, they recognized him and he disappeared. What's interesting to me is how much of the language in this story is taken straight out of the early liturgy. There are the, the took bread, blessed, broke, um, uh, opening the scriptures. Those are all kind of technical liturgy language. It's almost like the story is saying the early church found the risen Christ made real in their worship. But at face value, it's a road story. The second story is another road story. This time it's a Pentecost story. Philip is called by the Spirit to go to a certain road where he meets a fairly significant government official from Ethiopia. The official is on his way home after a festival. Now, this Ethiopian official was a eunuch, which meant he was ritually unclean. He was unwelcome in the inner courts of the temple, unwelcome in religious life, and that made it all the more extraordinary that he would take the time to go from home to Jerusalem for a festival to which he was really not welcome. I've met quite a few people who, for whatever reason because they're gay, because they're scientifically oriented, because of a bad experience in church, people who feel unwelcome in church. There are a lot of them out there. Well, the official and Philip talk, and whatever Philip, must have, whatever Philip said must have been very intriguing, because the Ethiopian asks him when they come to a stream if he can be baptized. And it's a very interesting form to the question, what is to prevent me from being baptized, the eunuch asks. And both he and Philip know the answer very well. He was unclean, imperfect, unsuitable. But Philip baptized him anyway, just like Peter would later baptize the uh, Gentile centurion Cornelius 
and his family. These are really important stories. With these two road stories under our belt about finding the risen Christ in encounters or worship, about being made welcome where the welcome was closed before, let's uh, rejoin the pilgrims getting off the train at Saint Jean Pied de Paul. It's, it's a little awkward there, that first few moments. We don't know each other, we don't really know where to go in this little town. We're all carrying packs, and so we introduce ourselves and ask, are, are you a peregrine? Yes, yes, we're all peregrinos. Um, and so we all headed off towards the town, hoping to find uh, the start of the Camino. We find the Camino office. Actually, the hospitalero finds us, I guess because he knows when the train is coming to town. Um, he directs us where we need to go. We register. We get our briefings. We are shown to the refugio, our first hostel. We pay the small fee, find a bunk, dump our stuff, and go exploring. By the time it comes to supper, we're getting a bit more familiar with each other, and we begin to ask the question that will drive many a conversation on the Camino. Why are you walking? See, here's my theory. Everybody has a reason. They may or may not share that reason, but everybody has a reason. How many saw the movie The Way? I know that was shown while we were here. It's a, it's a cool movie. But uh, the characters in that movie, the four main characters, Martin Sheen was walking with the ashes of his son, who had died on the first day of the pilgrimage. He was finishing the walk for his son, but also reassessing his life and his relationship with his son and his son's values. The woman from Canada, it emerged, had had an abortion. Sometimes I still hear my daughter's voice, she said, even though she never had a voice. Forgiveness? The Irishman, Jack from Ireland, was a writer who couldn't write. That's like being a singer who can't sing or a, a minister who has no faith or something. And the Dutchman, he said he was trying to lose weight and not until the very end, when he was receiving his certificate, did he say anything else. My wife won't sleep with me anymore because I'm fat. <sighs> Everyone has a reason. Not all are as deep or dramatic as the movie, but we are all carrying our hopes, our broken places, our endings, our questions, hoping for some bizarre reason that walking this path will heal us, will answer our questions, will send us forth into some new beginning after the ending. Even though most of the pilgrims are not religious, it is a very spiritual experience. It is a spiritual pilgrimage, I believe, for everybody. How does it work? Well, off we go in the morning, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. The first day, though, is 26 kilometers over the Pyrenees. 26 kilometers this way, a little over one kilometer this way. Um, it's a tough first day. I found myself part of the slower group, and we banded together to kind of encourage each other along the way. We were slow because at any given moment, we tended to go at the speed of the slowest person among us. That's a big thing. We encouraged each other. 
uh, we, we helped each other in simple ways. The, the first day, James and I, he's the guy on the, on the end standing up. Uh, James and I were walking along the path, bringing up the rear as usual, and we came across a sleeping bag lying in the road. We looked at each other and said, Some, someone's going to want this, and picked it up. Next stop where we met folks who were hanging out for lunch, we held it up. Anyone missing something? And Kim started rooting around in his bag. He says, I didn't even know I'd lost it. Yes, that's mine. Thank you. Later on, it was a pair of gloves that was lying in the path. That turned out to be James. And a couple days in, I was looking through my stuff and realized I had only one of a pair of socks. I thought, how do I lose one sock? And Fred held up my sock and said, does it look like this? So we took care of each other. Even the graffiti, and there's plenty of graffiti in Spain, is normally encouraging graffiti. We helped each other in simple ways. We encouraged each other. We built each other up. We walked alongside each other. And that's huge. And we talked. Just like Philip and the eunuch, just like the couple and Jesus, we talked on the way. And we talked at stops. This, this is a picture of the outside of a Spanish bar. Karen says it's Dave's happy place. Um, this, unfortunately, it's closed when Karen went through and took this picture. It was open when I was there. Bars are where we all stop. That's where the bathrooms are. It's where the coffee is. It's where the food is. Breakfast, lunch, and sometimes supper. Um, it's also where the town people gather, and it's where the pilgrims gathered and sat over whatever it was we were eating or drinking and, and talked. Um, now, people are pretty much good-hearted, but try as we might, we could never fix it for anyone else. We could never complete anyone else's quest for them. We couldn't supply the answers to other people's questions. All we did was hear each other out, share what we could, encourage as we were able. It all happened rather naturally, almost without effort, on the trail, over food. It's funny how simply sharing something with someone else, even a relative stranger, can help move us along the path. There were certain practices as well, besides walking and talking along the way. Karen and I would stop in churches on the way and would light candles, um, often for you, sometimes for people we were thinking of, sometimes for ourselves. We kept Sheila and Annie and Marion and various people as they, Jeanette, various people as they crossed our minds, we would light candles for them in various churches along the way. Um, this is the Cruz de Ferro. Um, we took some small stones with us on the way, um, one for you, one for me, for in my case, and Karen had a little collection of stones. This, this is where we left them. Uh, the Cruz de Ferro is near the top of one of the high passes through which the Camino goes. As you can see, there was still snow on the ground. The weather was terrible here, cold, windy, sleety. We left our stones with a prayer my stone, the one for myself, represented something I wanted to leave behind me on the road, uh, something I want to grow out of. And I noticed as I stood up there under the cross that someone had spray-painted on the road below, be not afraid. It was a surprisingly emotional moment. Rituals and practices, they help move our spirits forward, I think, whether it's um, lighting candles, keeping notes in a journal like the one you gave us, pausing each day to give thanks and recognize where we are, practices, rituals, they make a difference. Miles of walking, companionship along the way, conversation and encouragement the sense that we're all somehow in this together, even though each of our quests are different. And somehow at the end, as did the couple on the road to Emmaus and the Ethiopian eunuch, we found the crooked places in us had become a bit straighter, that doors we thought were closed 
looked maybe slightly ajar all of a sudden. Questions were beginning to find answers. Endings had become new beginnings. We were just walking, and grace found us along the way. In other words, what happened out there on the Camino, even though the majority of pilgrims were not church people, it was church out there. It was what the church is all about. None of us earned this grace, this healing. We we were just walking. But I can't help thinking that if we'd been sitting on a beach somewhere, drinking something with a little umbrella in it, none of this would have happened. We all walked with the desire to grow. We were all on something of a quest. Of course, we are also a church. We also have our own quests, our own broken places that need healing, our own endings that need new beginnings. We also have the privilege of companionship along the way, of ritual and practice to deepen our spirits, of encouragement and help. We're we're just going to church. We're just doing a habitat project. We're just volunteering for in from the cold or meals on wheels or on a committee. We're just just making lunches for the drop-in. We're just having breakfast or potluck supper. We're just doing a book club or whatever it is we do. We're just being a church. But on another level, we are on our own caminos always. Be on your own camino. Be on your own quest. Seek, and grace will find you. Grace will find you too along the way.